Hi, and welcome back to The Secret Life of Parkinson's. I'm Jessica Krauser, and I'm here with Brian Baker. Yay. Yay. Back at it. Brian, we have Dr. Korkos on with us today. Dr. Korkos, welcome. Hello, both of you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very honored to be here. I am super excited because you are going to talk about the Sparks 3 trial, which we'll get into in just a moment. But before that, can you introduce yourself, give us a little bit of your background? So I'm a professor at Northwestern University, and I'm an exercise neuroscientist, and my current passion is trying to devise exercise programs, exercise interventions that help people with Parkinson's disease both function better and ideally, if we're lucky, delay the rate at which the disease progresses. I also have a lab in which we extensively study deep brain stimulation and so my global interest uh, is to understand all the therapies for Parkinson's disease. So the three major therapies are a combination of exercise, medication, and deep brain stimulation. And I'm very, un I'm very interested in understanding how all three work hmm. and how all three can complement each other and how understanding when each one is a good idea at different stages of the disease becomes important to the person who has Parkinson's disease. You have a good little mix here then. I know. I've had, just because I'm medication, I'm on DBS and on no medication. Yeah. And we both exercise. Oh. So that's good. We have you all covered. Yeah. So is your main focus then with, with the SPARKS3 trial, it's, it's purely about exercise though, correct? The Sparks 3 trial is purely about exercise. So tell us about that. Like, where are you with it? Who's doing it? Do you need more participants? What, what does this look like? Well, we absolutely need more participants. One of our stellar exemplary sites is at Ohio Health. Mm. They mm -hmm. have already randomized several people. I had the privilege of talking there a few months ago and it's a wonderful place to get help and treatment and understanding of Parkinson's disease. We have 25 sites across the USA and Canada. We randomized 156 people out of a target of 370. So if you look at the exercise guidelines from the CDC, from the World Health Organization, from National Institute of Health, they're all very clear. All of us, with or without any disease, should be doing endurance exercise. Mm -hmm. This is very good for your cardiovascular system, your cardiopulmonary system. It's good for blood flow. It's good for getting oxygen to the brain. It's just good for you. And in fact, I'm quite sure Jessica would not disagree since Jessica is an elite runner. I wouldn't now, say elite runner, but that's okay. <laughs> well, uh, she looks to me like she is an elite runner. Thanks. So, um, the guidelines are that one can exercise at a moderate intensity. Think of that as an intensity that you can hold a conversation at. Okay. So, if you went out walking with a friend, a colleague, or Brian, Steve, Jessica, and you're having a conversation like this, you could be getting your heart rate up to say 65% of your peak. And we're comparing a peak heart rate of 60 to 65 with an exercise dose of 80 to 85%. Now, when you're at 80 to 85%, you can't do what I'm doing now, okay? Mm -hmm. If I I want a treadmill or a bike at 80 to 85%, having this monologue would be <laughs> quite hard. In mm -hmm. fact, it would be impossible. And the idea is, so we're testing the hypothesis that one dose is superior to the other. Mm -hmm. Now, at the moment, there's not enough evidence to clearly state that one do dose is preferable to the other. And that's why we have a phase three clinical trial. The other thing we're interested in is it is just possible now, just as some people don't like to run, others like 5Ks, others like marathons, that one dose may be better for some people and the other dose may be better for others. 
And so at the end of the trial, we will know how 185 per treatment arm respond. And so we'll be able to look at a group statistic, which answers the question, is high dose better than low dose? We'll also be able to look at individual performance to see whether some people do better at the lower or the higher dose. So does it matter? So I, I, well, I guess the question is, the way that you're doing this trial, are people on a treadmill or a bike or how? what activity are they doing? For a lot of reasons, we use the treadmill. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who love biking, mm -hmm. inside or outside, who love ellipticals, who love to swim, who love to row, at the moment, my view is they all are going to achieve the same goal if you get your heart rate up. Okay. We use the treadmill for several reasons. When you're going to write, when you write a phase three clinical trial, you have to show that there's a mechanistic underpinning, that there's a very strong biological basis. And it is much easier to get a mouse, a rat and a primate to exercise on a treadmill than for example, in a rowing machine or on an elliptical or if one is going to compare it to weight training, to do weight training. Mm -hmm. So the standard model for animal research uses a treadmill because certainly uh, rodents will stay on it all the time. And so it's easy to get the data. And the animal models are compelling that exercise is has a clear potential to protect neurons. It hasn't been shown in humans, but the animal work is really quite compelling. There is some debate as it really is protective, but from my point of view, the evidence is fairly strong. So how long has this trial, like how long has this study been going on and when is it supposed to be, I guess, wrapped up or when are you looking to well, have outcomes? Well, we started a couple of years ago, but as I'm sure you all realize, COVID-19 slowed us down yeah. a lot. Yeah. So people couldn't come into the hospital to be seen and they couldn't exercise in gyms. Right now, we've randomized 156 out of 370. And if we're lucky, we expect to finish randomization in August of 2025. It's a two year intervention. What we want to do is to really show that if you start the intervention, you can stay in it because my goal with exercise is changing lifestyle. Mm -hmm. The evidence is very clear. If you exercise and you stop, you lose most of the benefit quite quickly within four to six weeks. So the idea is to design a two year trial and keep people in. As of now, we've only had one person drop out out of the 156. So at the moment, our retention is very, very good. good. Do you have any, are you allowed to be on medication? Are you supposed to be on medication? Do you have anybody with DBS doing this? No, because this study is really designed to see if the study, if the exercise interven intervention can delay disease progression. Mm -hmm. We don't want this contaminated by medication because if a person's taking medication, it affects their symptoms and the dose will change over time. So we recruit people who are naive to medication and the person and their physician ask the question, do you think it's likely I will not need medicine over the first six months of the study? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is we do not think it is likely. Uh, then we um, recruit the person to the study with the explicit understanding that if they need medication, they can take it. Uh, our primary, secondary and tertiary goal is patient well-being. And so if the person either wants to take medication or the physician recommends they do, and the two of them agree, then they will take medication. But the goal is to keep people off medication as long as they and their physician are comfortable. Where do they, so for us in Ohio or in Columbus specifically, if um, if I was not on medication and I signed up, it would be at, I would go to 
the Ohio Health location, right? And uh, do you do people go there daily? Is it we like how often are uh, the subjects coming in, and how long are they exercising? Okay, so uh, participants exercise four times a week, or are instructed to. They have a five minute warm up, thirty minutes at the assigned heart rate, five minute cool down. Their options to exercise are one. If there is a facility close by, in other words, if they live close to Ohio Health mm -hmm. and they could exercise at Ohio Health, that is great. Um, happens rarely because most people live too far away. Okay. Secondly, we pay for the use of an exercise facility. So it could be a YMCA, uh, it could be your local gym, in and around where I live, there are more and more places blossoming everywhere where you can go and work out. So within about half a mile of where I live, there are probably six different places where you could go in to work out on a mm -hmm. treadmill. And the third possibility is that some people, for a variety of very good reasons, like to exercise at home. And so we purchase a treadmill for you at home. And then is there an app? Are they wearing something? Like, how is that all transcribed That's back to you? Question. There is, so people wear a heart rate monitor. Okay. And that measures your heart rate because since it's a dose response study, we need to make sure at the end of the study that the two treatment arms are exercising at a different dose. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in the study, we have a website, sparks3.com. If you're not interested, if you're not interested in the study, still go to spark3.com because if you go towards the end, you'll see a whole bunch of really lovely dogs. So we have lots and lots of canines supporting all the people working on Spark 3. And one of the nice things about Zoom is you get to learn basically how people live at home. And of course, the dog comes along and helps the investigator. So we've got beautiful pictures of wonderful dogs. So it's worth going to the website for more than one reason. That's great. I know we talked about um, we talked about this briefly when you were in Columbus uh, speaking at the Ohio Health uh, Symposium. But just to refresh my memory, the outcomes that you want to see from this study is that obviously we want to show that exercising at a certain rate, you're getting your heart rate to a certain level, um, is beneficial and will help help delay the disease, the progression of Parkinson's disease. But with that outcome, then what do you do? Is this for, you know, selling it into companies or insurance companies so that they can pay for us to exercise because we have to in order to alleviate further medications? Like what, what do you do with the outcome? Yeah, that is a very clever question. Um, I'm an optimist, so I'll give you my most optimistic answer. Okay. Uh -huh. First of all, only 28% of Americans get the required amount of exercise. And the statistics are very clear. There's much more disease in America than it's good for people. Mm -hmm be it diabetes, various metabolic disorders, and many of those are related to lifestyle. And so the goal here, first of all, is to help people with Parkinson's disease change their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So there are some people like Jessica who was an athlete, is an athlete, and always will be an athlete. There are some people, many people out there for whom the E word, exercise, the E word is not a word that is particularly liked. So we can use words like activity or anything which is fun related. Mm -hmm. My primary goal is to provide enough evidence that it really almost jolts a person. So I'm acutely aware that upon being diagnosed, upon receiving the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, it's a life changing moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And 
the idea is to have so much compelling evidence that people who haven't adopted a uh, healthy lifestyle change, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I'm working on a book with Christine Meldrum uh, out of Iowa, and in it she has example after example after example of people who, for example, were either in a wheelchair or a walking stick, drank the Kool-Aid and really did change their life. That's I awesome. understand also that exercise can be expensive. Health clubs are expensive. And to begin with, it really is good to have somebody who can help you through. So the second goal is to work eventually with insurance companies. So phase three clinical trial is the top of the clinical trial food chain. Mm -hmm. And so this provides quite clear, definitive exercise evidence. And therefore, the hope is that insurance companies will appreciate that it is to their advantage to keep people in good health. And so there is a cost to medication over time. There's a substantial cost to DBS over time. And the fewer people who have DBS and the lower the use of medication, the better, all other things being equal. I'm working with a colleague at Intermountain Health in Utah, and they have what is called a values-based health system mm -hmm. where the reward is to keep the costs low. And my colleague, Dr. Kathleen McKee, is basically implement implementing her health care of her patients around the same principles we use in Sparks 3. So I am quite confident that the exercise message will get out. I am confident that a number of people with clear evidence will change their patterns of behavior. Mm -hmm. I am confident that certain healthcare systems will benefit fully. Am I confident we'll get all insurance companies on board? Well, Jessica, I think with your charm and lobbying, we will get <laughs> all the healthcare systems on board. So my confidence has just gone up even more. <laughs> right, especially, I, I have to tell you, I so I work for a pharmaceutical consulting company. So as long as I keep that gig going, we'll see if we can make any traction with getting to payers and, and telling the right story so that we can, we can get something like that in the future, because that would be awesome. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm certainly happy to meet anybody who will listen. I have all the data. There's a lot of economic data behind there. Mm -hmm. One of the programs which I'm particularly, um, I would say fond of for want of a better term, is silver sneakers. Mm -hmm. So there are systems or programs whereby people are encouraged, rewarded to maintain their health. Yeah. And you know, at some level, this is gonna have to come because if you look at the total expenditures on health now, they are astronomical. You project out 30 years and they are not sustainable. And it's partly because the population is aging and associated with aging are comorbidities. And mm -hmm. so change has to happen. It's really only a question of time. Are there any other studies that have done this yet before or something similar to what you were doing? Or is this completely new to the industry? Like, I know exercise has been around and known, but to actually have clinical evidence, has that ever been done? Uh, yes. Okay. okay. So just like, so I, I walked you through the importance of animal studies. Mm -hmm. You've also have, to have studies on humans to go to phase three. Yep. So if you look through the literature, there have been treadmill studies, but they've tended to be short, but they've been beneficial. And the other thing to mention about treadmills, one reason why we tend to use them, apart from the fact that they're very good to get your heart rate up, is that they do help your walking. And so mm. part of having Parkinson's disease is that your gait may decline over time. A walking exercise not only is helping your cardiovascular system, it's also helping your locomotor system. Mm -hmm. So there have been many small treadmill studies uh, the most 
eye-catching study was performed by Angela Ridgell uh, working with Jay Alberts. And this was a cycling study back in 2009, and they showed striking benefits of cycling on reducing the signs of Parkinson's disease. Oh, wow. And you go to many places now, there are cycling programs everywhere for people with Parkinson's disease, and they're very beneficial. In 2018, uh, I was involved in publishing Sparks 2. That was a phase two clinical trial. Okay. So the important thing here to know is that you've got to go slowly. So Sparks 3 is very expensive. Mm -hmm. It will cost eventually the taxpayer probably $30 million. And NIH doesn't want to spend that amount of money um, without having a probability of success. Now, many studies do fail. Right. And if you get a bigger and bigger study, um, there are many reasons why studies fail. But the idea is to only go to phase three when you've got a lot of evidence mm -hmm. behind you. And this is no different to, uh, to being in the um, pharmaceutical right. industry where they start with phase zero and phase one. And at that point, it is only primarily about safety and tolerability. Mm -hmm. One doesn't even worry about efficacy because if a drug is not safe, then it doesn't matter how good it yeah. is, it's just not Can't safe. Go and if the side effects are intolerable, um, and then you build up to phase two, and then when everything is looking good, when you've got a drug with a signal, side effects which are low, and are safe. It's no different here. So the nice thing about exercise is that the side effects are few. Now, certainly for those of you who run, yes, you can have the odd uh, muscle injury. Mm -hmm. um, side effects of exercising are, virtu are very, very few, and the benefits are immense. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, this was awesome. I love the work that you're doing. I'm super excited to see how this comes to fruition and how this will change the lifestyle of so many people living with Parkinson's. So thank you again so much for explaining uh, the depth of Sparks 3 with us. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. Well, it's a real pleasure. I came out to Ohio Health earlier this year. Always happy to come to Ohio where the medical treatment is just first rate. Well, we'll be sure to have you back again uh, soon, I'm sure. So in our last 30 seconds, we'll leave you with this. If you haven't already, please go to sparks3.com. We'll leave the website up here for you, but sparks3.com to see if this is something that you would like to participate in, as it's a great study to get us all moving, keep us active, and hopefully delaying this disease and delaying its progression. As always, consult with your doctor and stay tuned in for next time. Thanks so much.